Amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 11, the Bible begins there in verse 1 where it says, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. And what's interesting to notice here right out of the gate is that we've got to remember it begins with the word therefore. And that old principle in scripture, you know, anytime you see the word therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. And really the therefore there is what we read last week in chapter 10. If you would just back up there. He's saying, what is the reason you should love the Lord your God? What is the reason you're going to keep his charge and his statutes? What, you know, what's the therefore? Well, he says in chapter 10, verse 17, For the Lord your God is a God of gods uh, <coughs> and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty God, and a terrible God. Verse 20, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, and hath done these uh, for thee these great and terrible things which his eyes have seen. That's the therefore because of who God is and all the great things that he's done for them. That's why he rolls right into chapter 10, or chapter 11, excuse me, and begins by saying, therefore, because of who God is, because of what he's done for you, you know, that's why you're going to love him and to keep his charge. That's why you're going to obey him. And really verse, uh, you know, verse 21 there in, in uh, <clears throat> chapter 10, that's kind of the theme of chapter 11. And actually it's pretty much the theme of a lot of the book of Deuteronomy, and in fact, the whole Bible. And it goes on there in verse 2, and it says, And know ye this day. So he starts out and he says, Look, you're going to love God. You're going to keep his charge and his statutes. And then he moves right. And then he goes on and says, verse 2, And know ye this day. Now when he says, And know ye this day, I don't think he's saying know ye in the sense of, Hey, this is new information. Here, this is something you need, to, you, know, you need to understand now. He's not introducing like, you know, Hey, he's not teaching them something no, new. He's saying like, And you already know this. And know ye this day. Does that make sense? Uh, for what I spake unto your children, uh, he said, And know ye this day, I speak not with your children which have not known and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God. So he's saying, look, know ye this day, not in the sense of he's teaching them something new, but in the sense of you know, not being forgetful of what they've already learned. Because we are understanding, you know, in chapter 10, he's already rehearsed all this. He's reminding them of all the things that they've already uh, gone through. You know, and that's, that's where you kind of get the meaning in that, where is it's kind of becomes apparent, see, because he says, For I speak not with your children which have not known. He's saying, look, know ye this day, because, hey, you already know. You know this this day, that this is who I am, and this is what I expect. And he goes on and says, uh, you know, <coughs> that they have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God in his greatness. Now, it's interesting that they have... Uh, known and seen, he says there. Look, you've known it and you've seen the chastisement, right? Because you have to remember the generation that this is, he's addressing here. He's addressing the generation that came up, that was raised by those that came out of Egypt and those that have wasted in the wilderness those 40 years and have passed off the scene, those that were disobedient the first time when they came to the River Jordan and he said, hey, look, because of your unbelief, you're going to go and wander until this generation, you know, 20 years and upward is perished. So he's saying, look, you've known it and seen it, but he had, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have been the ones that endured that directly. They're familiar with the chastisement of God. They're familiar with the fact that God is a God who punishes uh, the disobedient. And it's not necessarily because they have been, you know, uh, suffered that directly. I mean, I'm sure they, they, there were some residual effects that they had to deal with. But they know and seen it because they watched it take place in the previous generation. They were there as children as that previous gen generation came up to, to uh, you know, the River Jordan. They were there when the 12 spies came back and the 10 had the evil report. They were children at that time. And they knew and they saw what God did because of their unbelief. Their ch the chastening that the, their parents endured. And really this is a really you know, important uh, you know, principle that we need to apply to our own lives. Especially those of us that are younger. Is that you know, learn from the mistakes of others rather than trying to learn yourself. You know, just take, take the words uh, of those of us that have already made the mistakes and have already had to learn the hard way and just trust us when we tell you, hey, you don't want to do this, yeah, you do want to do this. Mm -hmm. you know, you don't, and that's what, that's what you see going on here. They've already learned it. You know, why do you think it was so much easier for them to go over the River Jordan to the Promised Land? Because they already saw the previous mistake of the previous generation. They said, well, let's not, let's not repeat that. We've already saw that's what happens. You know, they didn't have to go and try that out for themselves to see if it was going to be different, if things were going to go differently. So learn from the mistakes of others. Learn from the mistakes of the previous generation. And, and you know what? Newsflash, not every generation is going to be perfect. You know, this generation that's coming up uh, behind us, you know, th th those of us that are older, the next generation that's coming up, you know, there's going to be things that we get wrong. 
we're not going to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. And you know, you're, you know, the next generation, they're going to make mistakes and they're not, they're not going to be perfect. But learn from the mistakes of the previous generation and don't feel like you have to just go out and make those same mistakes yourself. So I thought that was a, an interesting you know, principle you see there. Is he's saying, look, you already know. You've seen the chastisement of the Lord. You know his greatness, his mighty hand, and his stretched out arm. Now, when he, when he starts to remind them of this fact in verse 2, you'll notice that he, he kind of does it out of chronological order. Right? He starts out with the chastisement. And then he moves into his greatness and his mighty hand and his stretched out arm. Then he moves into verse 3 where he says, And his miracles and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt. Now, which came first? The chastisement in the wilderness or the mighty acts in Egypt? Well, it was the chastisement. You know, you know, it was after they came out of Egypt that God began to chasten them. But that's not the way God rehearses it to them here. He puts the chastisement first. And I think that's, you know, that he does it out of, he puts it out of chrono chronological order for a reason. And what he's trying to do, I believe, is God is trying to emphasize the negative. The, you know, the negativity, the, 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 the negative effects of disobedience. And really, when we look at this, this passage here in verses 3 through 6, actually through 7, uh, you'll notice that it actually, that's how uh, it's actually bookend by negative uh, events. So he goes on in verse 3, he says, You've seen his miracles and his acts, and which he did in the midst of Egypt, and to Pharaoh and the king of Egypt, and all his land. That's positive. When they were delivered out of, by a mighty hand. And what he did under the army of Egypt, and under their horses and their chariots, and he made the water of the Red Sea to overflow them after they pursued after you. And how the Lord hath destroyed them under this day. This is all positive for Israel. And then he goes on in verse 5, And what he did to you in the wilderness when, until you came unto his, this place. Oh, what he did unto Dathan and Abiram. So now he's getting real specific. He's calling out names, right? You remember that negative thing that happened in the wilderness. The sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the, them up and their households and their tents and all their substance that was in their possession in the midst of Israel. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord, which he did. So if you notice there, again, he starts out saying, look, you've seen the, the generation before you. You saw the chastisement in the wilderness. You know, and, and he bookends the, these great things, these positive things that God did for them with two negative events. And what I think God is trying to do there, again, is to emphasize the negative. And it's important that we keep that in mind because we're living in a day of positive-only preaching yeah. where people only want to talk about positive things, where every message has got to be a feel-good message, where people just want to have their back scratched and their ears tickled and just told everything's fine, God's not mad with you, you know, come as you are, stay as you were, don't bother making any changes in your life. And that's just not God. That's not the Bible. And this is a great example of it, that God deals in the negative. That God puts emphasis on the negative, and it's always for our benefit. <coughs> you know, we should be more concerned about what God will do to us if we disobey than what he will do for us if we obey. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. We should be more concerned about what God will do to us if we disobey than what he will do for us if we obey. Sometimes in the Christian life, we always just get so busy thinking about all the blessings that we want from God. And we want from God, what will God do for me here if I do this and if I do that? You should just be more concerned with not getting out of sorts with God and not having to suffer the, the chastening hand of God. I mean, just focus on that. That's, that's, you know, that's what I see here when I read this passage. Yeah, God did a lot of great things, but with the people that got chastened, man, it, it, it wasn't good. I mean, the earth swallowed them. <laughs> you know, it just opens up and all their household goes down in it. You know, the, the, they're perishing in the wilderness. You know, if we would just focus more on keeping, you know, being right and not always just so focused on what we can get out of God and not just turn God into some spiritual vending machine where if I do enough good things, then God's going to bless me. You know, God does want to do good unto us. God does want to bless us. God does want to do great things for us. But we should probably just stay focused on staying right with God. And if we would just do that, then, you know, these other things would probably fall into place. Because, you know, the unchastened life, you know, you want to live to bless life, live an unchastened life. Live a life of obedience. That is a blessing. Just the fact that God's not going to chasten you, that in itself is a blessing. <coughs> the Bible says, and if you would, turn over to Romans 5. Romans 5. The Bible, and you know, it just reminds me of 1 Samuel. What, what Samuel said to, uh, to Saul. You know, when he disobeyed. He said, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. You know, rather, that's the best thing you could do for God. It says to obey Him and do what He says. For rebellion as the sin is, witch, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as an iniquity and idolatry. I mean, that's, that's how God, that's what He thinks of, of people who are rebellious 
and people who are idolatrous and people who do not want to obey. I mean, it's like witchcraft to him. It's, it's that wicked. So we don't want to underestimate the dangers of disobedience. And, you know, I, saw, and I know this is redundant. I know that the Bible, you know, I, I've been, I feel like I've been preaching on that a lot as we go through the book of De Deuteronomy. But the only reason why I am is because that's what the Bible is dealing with. Right. That's what this book is about so far. So if it sounds like a broken record, it's not my fault. And what it tells me is that, you know, God puts a real strong emphasis on it. Right. And he keeps drilling it in over and over and over. And, and it just seems like it's something that he really wants to get through our heads. Because of, and you say, well, why is that? Because some people seem to just underestimate the dangers of being disobedient. They think, oh, God's just going to give me a slap on the wrist, or maybe he won't notice if I just do this or that, or I get out of sorts. Look, I mean, when people disobey, bad things happen. Unforeseen consequences come about. Think about even just with mankind, the fall of mankind. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That's talking about Adam. Adam just took that one, just that one moment of disobedience, just that one little sin, right? Just that one time, didn't do anything else, just a harmless little bite of the fruit. You know, I know God didn't say to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. What's the worst that could happen? Oh, I don't know. You could plunge all of humanity into, into, into sin. And that's every, you know, it goes on and says there, uh, <laughs> verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, disobedience many were made sinners. So the obedience of one shall many shall be made righteous. All it took was one time. Just one guy being disobedient one time and just everybody's, now we're all in for it. So don't underestimate the dangers of disobedience. You know, we think like it's not that big a deal. You don't know what could happen. You know, if you just, you know, do that one thing, you know, you're not, not supposed to, you don't know what the consequences are. And there's probably a lot of people that if they knew what the consequences were going to be would not have done what they did. People have made mistakes. They'll say, if I could just go back and change it. But here's the thing, you can't. That's right. Once mistakes are made, that's it. It's over. It goes on there. Go over to uh, Re uh, Romans chapter 16. You know, our reputation will be based on our obedience or lack thereof. You know, with God, at least, maybe, maybe those around you might not think it's that important. But with God, you know, he, he, you know, your reputation with him is based on the level of your obedience. I mean, think about the people he mentioned back there in Deuteronomy, Dathan and Abiram. And they're going down in the pages of, of Scripture for all eternity as those wicked men that they were, as those disobedient rebels that they were. That entire generation that perished in wilderness. You know, I'm, I'm sure you know, many of them were saved. We'll see them in heaven. and be like, oh, you were with the children of Israel? They'll be like, yeah, yeah, I was, I was there. You know, try to end the conversation real quick. Hey, have you seen, uh, you know, you've been over this part of heaven yet? And like, so what, what part of, uh, you didn't say, what part of, uh, what generation were you with? Uh, were you there? Were you there at Egypt? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Oh, you're those people that lacked faith. You're those people that disobeyed God. Right? right? That's their reputation, you know? And, that, and then we have to be careful, you know, that's the reputation people can de develop as just to be rebels, you know? That's, that's something that uh, <coughs> can happen. Look here in Romans chapter 16, verse 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. Now, I know in this context here, he's talking about salvation, the fact that they've obeyed the gospel. But this is something, a principle that we could even apply in our own lives. I mean, think about people we could, we could talk about that we all know, that are, we have common uh, knowledge of, that have been uh, you know, disobedient to the Lord. And what have they got? They've got a soiled reputation. They've sullied it. And they've, got, they've become bywords. They've become proverbs to, to this movement, to our church and things like that. Hey, don't, don't be like so-and-so. And what were they? Disobedient. They disobeyed. Right, and they ruin their reputation. Now, book ro uh, bookmark Romans. Excuse me. Keep something there. We're going to come back at the end. We go ahead and turn back to uh, to Deuteronomy. <coughs> you know, we should just be so preoccupied with obeying God and pleasing God that you know, if if, if we would just do that, if we would just focus on you know, I'm just going to obey God, do what I need to do every day to please Him. You know, you probably wouldn't even find yourself being tempted to disobey as much. When is it that we're tempted to disobey? When we're not, you know, when we're idle. When we're just kind of not moving forward. We're just kind of idle, taking it easy, just kind of thinking, well, what, what can I do? And that's when trouble comes, is when people are just idle. So if we would just stay busy, you know, preoccupying ourselves with just pleasing God, reading our Bibles, praying, going soul winning, coming to church, 
you know, memorizing scripture, uh, being a blessing, you know, uh, whatever it is, just, uh, just developing in our Christian life. If we would just focus on that, you know, we wouldn't even have a lot of time to get into trouble, to even be tempted to disobey. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalm 19, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More desire to, uh, to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also uh, than the honeycomb, <clears throat> the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them thy servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. He's saying, look, you know, you keep the commandments, the judgments of the Lord, there's, the, you know, you're warned by them. And when you keep them, there's reward. You know, that's what we need to focus on in our life is keeping the judgments of God, keeping his commandments, and then the rewards will just come. You know, the, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be blessed as we go. And people say, well, you know, I just feel like the Christian life is, you know, is just all about robbing me and my fun. You know, it's, I'm, I'm missing out on all this, this fun stuff that the world's doing. Look, you're, you're missing out. You, there might be some things that are genuinely fun that maybe you don't get to do, but a lot of it's sin, and there's pleasure that goes along with it. I'm not denying that. But you, what you don't see is the consequences that come. Yep, that's right. No one ever comes to you and says, hey, do you want to go do this? It has terrible consequences. <laughs> hey, this is going to turn out real bad. This is gonna be, th we're going to suffer uh, for the rest of our life by going and doing this activity. Do you want to come with us? If they put it to you like that, who in, the, who in the right mind would say yes? Is that ever how they approach you with that kind of thing, when people want you to come do bad things with them? Hey, man, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you say, well, what if? They'll say, oh, you know, quit worrying about that. Nothing's going to happen. People always say that. Something happens. You know, th something about to happen. You know? <laughs> That's what you got to think to yourself. When they, some of them just think, hey, something's about to happen. Right? Because something will happen, and it's not going to be good. But people think, oh, well, you're just trying to rob me of my fun. The Bible's just got all these rules. You know, the preacher just doesn't want me to have any fun. No, you know, it's clean. It's enduring. You know, there's, you're warned by them. You're being warned. And in keeping this, there's great reward. It's just not, you're, it's just, a great reward is not immediate gratifi gratification. That's the problem. As people just want to be immediately gratified in their flesh. They just want to do whatever feels good. That's the culture we're living in. If it feels good, do it. You know, live for today. Do whatever you want. You know, uh, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, right? That Satanist Aleister Crawley, that's what he said. You know, that was the Beatles mentality. That was the, that generation. Do as thou wilt. You know, if it feels good, do it. You know, who's to say right or wrong? Well, that, you know, go ahead and live that way, but just be prepared to suffer the consequences that come with it. You know, the, the free love. Go out, you know, go out and live a life of fornication. But be prepared for the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the pregnancies out of wedlock. Be prepared for, you know, the, uh, uh, the diseases that come. Yep. Prepared for the heartache that comes with that. Just be prepared for the consequences. You know, or whatever area it is. You know, you think about drugs and the alcohol that, that people are always trying to get tempted into doing with other folks. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, 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 it's groovy, man, right? But, hey, there's a lot of consequences. Go, you know, be prepared to have, a, to be stupid. <laughs> Go fry your brain on some drugs. Go, go. You never know what could happen. That's that. I mean, you're praying. You're playing Russian roulette when you when you take drugs. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, especially these days, there's so much out there you can get into, and you know, <laughs> I really don't want to get into it. You know, in my own past, but I've known people that are just lost their minds. Yeah. Friends that I just saw go completely off the rails, just gone. Like, and and they're finally, you know, they're, they, they it took them years to come around and start to recover from the things that they did. And praise God, I didn't get swept up in it and taken away with it. You know, friends that, uh, again, I don't want to get into it. But here's the thing. People, everybody thinks, oh, the Bible is just a bunch of rules. You guys are just trying to steal all my fun. Well, no, they're trying, it's trying to spare you from all the bad things that come. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 3, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. You want to know how so much someone loves God? It's how much they keep his commandments. You know, that, and we talked about that last week. And it says, and his commandments are not grievous. Yep. Look, if the commandments of God are grievous to you, you need to search your heart. You need to ask God to help you to, to, to get your heart right. And you've got to you come to a place of understanding that his commandments are there to, uh, you know, that they're sweeter than the honeycomb and the honey. That then, you know, that you're being warned by them. And that's a good thing that someone's saying, hey, danger over here. Don't, don't do that. 
You know, what, what kind of loving person would just let you walk blindly into some minefield? You know, they're going to put up the signs. They're going to put things up. Danger. Stay. You know, even on the road, people put up signs to tell you to slow down. You know, whether or not we do that is up to us, right? You come off that, you know, we're in Tucson, but, you, you know, you're heading, you're heading uh, what is it, east on the 60, and you're going to take the 101 north, and that turnpike, and it says 25 miles an hour for a reason. And you only had to go down it once before you realize you better hit, you better get down to 25 on that, on that exit ramp because, man, that thing, there's just black marks all over the place on the, on the walls and your tires squeaking. But, hey, what if they just say, well, you know, who are we to say that people can't do 65 around this corner? Who are we to tell people to slow down and take it easy here? We don't want to kill their good time. So we don't want to be a downer. You know, we don't want to be grievous to them. So let's just go let them, just let them do whatever they want. There'd be wrecks there every day. You know, these, these, these commandments, these signs, these warnings are there not to bring us down and to ruin our good time, but to keep us from making a mess out of our lives. Now, if you would go back to Deuteronomy and look there in verse 8, he says, Therefore shall ye keep the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong. He said, you know what's going to make you strong? You know what's going to make you able to endure? Is if you keep his commandments and go in and possess the land whether you go to possess it. Why? Verse 9, that you may prolong your days. The Bible is saying here that, hey, if you keep his commandments, you're going to be strong, you're going to prolong your days. You're not going to catch the disease. You know, you're not going to get, you're not going to smoke yourself to lung cancer. You're not going to drink yourself to death and die an early life like so many people do. If you obey, if you keep his commandments. <laughs> you may prolong your days and the Lord, which the Lord swear to your fathers to give unto their seed <coughs> a land that floweth with milk and honey. Now, if you would keep something there, go to Psalm chapter 34. Psalms chapter 34. You know, <coughs> I'm sure everybody in the room wants to live a long life. You know, if not, you know, you, you might, you know, maybe it's, maybe we need to have some counseling or something. I don't know. You know, we need to talk, get some, work some things out. Right? <coughs> So he's saying here, look, if you want long days, keep his commandments. And that's the message of the Bible. He says in Psalm 34, you're going there, I'll read to you from Proverbs 3. It says, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. You want a long life? You want peace along the way? You want uh, length of days? Well, then you know what he says? Let thine heart keep my commandments. You know, learn the Word of God, obey the Word of God, and you're going to live that long life. And you're going to have peace along the way. Look there in Psalm uh, uh, chapter 34, verse 11. Come, you children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Well, that doesn't... You're going to tell us, <laughs> you're going to tell us scary stories? What, what's going on here? No, I'm going to teach you about who God is and what He's like. Yeah. And it's going to cause you to be afraid of Him. Right. You know, that's, you know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, that, that's, that's where it all starts, you know, and we kind of went over that, I know, previously, but here it is again. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. That's a good thing to learn. Yeah. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, that he may say good? I mean, who doesn't want to live a good, long life? Don't raise your hand, you know, because, you know, we, some of us are packing heat. We can help you with that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he says, hey, you know, who doesn't want to live a long life and, love it and, lo and loveth many days, that he may say good? Well, here's, here's how you get that. Yeah, we all want that. Well, how do we get it? Verse 13, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. See, there's two parts to that equation. It's not enough to just do good. To just show up at church and, you know, play the part, sing the song, say amen, you know, and be, you know, do the soul winning and, and, and just do everything that you know you're supposed to do. And then turn around Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, the rest of the week living like the devil. There's two parts there. You have to depart from the evil and do good. It's not, you know, just do good and, and then that's going to balance out. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the, earth, from the face of the earth. Or from the earth, excuse me. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. So again, I mean, God is just emphasizing obedience over and over and over. And over and over and over. It's the main theme in this book and elsewhere in Scripture. <coughs> so he said there, you know, uh, 
Keep the commandments which I command you this day that it may be strong, that it may prolong your days. He's taking you to land which flow with the milk and honey. Verse 10, for the land where thou goest to in to possess it, it is not as that land of Egypt where you came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass, if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain in your land in his due season, and, and the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. <coughs> and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest be full, and that thou mayest eat and be full. So this is kind of, you know, interesting that back then when they were, you know, when people were living uh, a more, well, there, most people were farmers and they were living off the land. They were, you know, more involved with agriculture. You know, they, it seems like they were a little bit more dependent upon God. You know, and I can't help but wonder, maybe the reason why our country is just so far from God and cares so little for the things of God is quite frankly because they can get everything, they can get a can of food. You know, we were talking about the service about uh, this evening about um, is there going to be another Great Depression? You know, and I said, well, I hope so. Because that's what people need sometimes to, to get shaken out of their safe little worlds, to wake up and realize that there's still a God in heaven and that, you know, they, they can, that everything can change like that. And maybe they'll actually seek after God. I mean, back then they were so, I mean, they were so much more reliant upon the land and that was, God used it and said, hey, if you seek me, I'll, let, I'll send the rain. If you disobey me, I won't send the rain. You know, if you seek me, I'm going to send the grass, your cattle's going to eat, and you're going to be full. And today, you know, everything is just, you know, genetically modified. They send locusts, God sends locusts, man just makes up some new pesticide to kill the locust and, po and poison himself in the process. You know, he has some hybrid plant that can, that can you know, withstand these things. Drought-resistant plants. And people say, well, why isn't God doing this? Well, I believe God is, we just, we don't see it as much. You know, we're not paying attention. People are distracted. I mean, there's, there's wildfires everywhere. There's hurricanes and tornadoes. I mean, God is still trying to deal with people. You go ask those people in that trailer park in Oklahoma or wherever that tornado tear through. You know, it's always a trailer park, right? And go ask them if they thought, maybe some of them would probably go, you know what, I think God did that. Right. I bet you you would. I bet if you went to talk to those people, they'd say, boy, it feels like, you know, God was trying to get my attention when this happened. You know, we don't do it because we don't live in the trailer park. You know, we didn't get hit by the tornado. <laughs> but these people here and back then, it just seems like, man, they were so much more reliant immediately upon the land and the cattle and everything that God kind of had them where he wanted them. And not that God can't still reach down and touch us. I'm not saying we've made ourselves immune from the wrath of God. I'm just saying, you know, maybe God's letting things slide a little bit longer and he's just letting it all build up. Maybe he's waiting until the cup of his wrath of his indignation is full before he finally pulls it out, pours it out. <clears throat> but back then it was pretty immediate. He's like, they stepped out of line. Well, th guess what? There's no rain. And that would probably get him back in line a little bit quicker. He goes on and he says there, Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and that you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up in heaven. And he shut up uh, the heaven that there be no rain. So notice, you know, again, there's consequences for forgetting the Lord, for, for casting off God. God doesn't just walk away, you know, feeling sorry for himself when his people depart from him. When they go into idolatry, when they go into wickedness, when their hearts, hearts are hardened, when they're deceived and they forget God, God doesn't just suck his thumb in the corner and boo-hoo. God does something about it. You know, God rains up and he clouds on them, or clouds up and rains on them to get their attention, to bring them back to himself. You know, and that's, that's, that's who God is. Now we can start to understand why we should be taught the fear of the Lord. Because God isn't just this passive old man in heaven who's just going to let things slide and let people walk all over him. You know, he's not going to let his people just get away with it. You know, if you're God's child, you know, that's, that's a blessing. Amen. But you know what? It, 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 you should probably take heed to what, the, what we're doing, the way we're living our lives. Because God is not going to just let us get away with it. So, <laughs> you know, God, we want to have God's blessing in our lives. And if you would, let's look here at verses 18 through 22. We're going to kind of transition. We want to obey. We want God's blessings. We want God to, you know, 
provide for us. We want him to, to, to bless us in life. Well, how do we get that? Well, one, re- one way of getting it is through you know, knowing his word. Obviously, it's through keeping his commandments, knowing his judgments. You're not going to know that. Uh, you know, the only way you're going to know that is through his word. You know, that's, that's, how, that's the how to know, get to know God, how to please God manual is the Bible. Verse 18, it says, Therefore you shall lay up these my words in your heart and your soul. He's saying, look, you need to keep my commandments. You need to keep my judgments. You need to do what I'm telling you. You need to obey, is essentially the message here. Fear and obey me. And then he says in verse 18, Therefore, because of this fact, ye shall lay up my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets before your eyes. You know, God puts a strong emphasis on reading the Bible. On people, his people knowing what the Bible says. Because in, ignorance is not an excuse with God. You can't just say, well, I never read that. Right. Well, did you have a Bible? Right. I mean, if you don't have a Bible tonight, t- come talk to me. We'll get you a Bible. I'll pull one off the shelf of shame. <laughs> <laughs> and give it to you. It'll be your brand new. I'll get you a brand new Bible. We'll go down to the dollar store after church and I'll buy you six of them. Or maybe even seven. You know, we'll, we'll get a bunch for everybody. That's not an excuse, especially in this country. But even if you didn't have it, that doesn't, that's not an excuse. But here's the thing. We do, we do have it. You know, it's nigh us. It's in our hands. You've got it in your lap tonight, more than likely. It might even be open. <laughs> but he's saying, look, if you want me to bless you, therefore lay up these my words in your heart. Know the Bible. Know what it says. Learn it. And bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets before your eyes. And you shall teach your children, them your children, speak to them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, the land which the Lord thy God swear to your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. So God is just putting a huge emphasis here on our need to know and read and understand the Bible and to teach it to our children. And we should be teaching our kids the Bible. You know, I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, my wife, she, she spends a lot of time just sitting down with the kids every day, just reading the Bible, explaining the Bible stories. Look, when you have a little, you know, a child, you don't have to dive into, you know, the more complex and deep, difficult things of Scripture. You know, you can teach them the story of, you know, you know Noah and the ark. David and Goliath, they like that stuff. I mean, there's, there's good stuff in the, and, and there's great things that kids can learn from the Bible. The Bible addresses children directly. Amen. It says, children, obey your parents. It doesn't say, parents, tell your children to obey you. It says, children, it's addressing children. So the Bible is written for kids too. Are we reading it to them? Are we teaching it to them? Are we doing it? I mean, the Bible, I mean, let's take the Bible's challenge here. Are we doing it when we walk by the way? Are we doing it when we lie down, when we rise up? It's like 24-7. Every opportunity that you have to teach your child a, a principle out of Scripture, take advantage of it. You know, help them. Why? Because you want long days and, and a long life, length of days, and peace? It's through God's Word. It's through keeping His commandments. I mean, how are we going to keep God's commandments if we don't know them? God says, you want to be blessed? You want, then obey. I'll keep my commandments. Okay, what are they? Well, they're in the Bible. So how are we going to know God's commandments if we're not reading it? How are we going to know what God wants to expect from us if we're not you know, listening to the preaching? If we're not reading for ourselves? If we're not, you can't expect your children to obey if you're not telling them what it is they need to do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why you know, provoke not your children or your sons under wrath. You know, give them clear instructions on what it is you expect. <clears throat> you know, how will we know them if we don't how will we know the commandments if we don't read them for ourselves, if we don't Memorize them. Keep them as the front line. I mean, how are you going to get this signed copy of the Christmas CD if you don't memorize Job 28? You're not going to get this. Hopefully no one's taking me seriously on that. They're like, frame, that's a bride thing. I get it. Forget it. I was going to do it, but not now. It's a joke. <clears throat> you know, how will our children learn the commandments of God if we fail to teach them? <clears throat> you want God on your side? This is it right here. You have to get in the book. You have to open it and read it and know it and understand it and apply it to your life. Verse 23, Then will the Lord drive out these nations from before you. Then God will come to your aid. God, then God will bless you and be on you. Know, it's, it's, 
But people want to put the, uh, the, the, the cart before the horse. They want God to come to their aid, but they don't want to know anything about what it is, it is he expects them, uh, of them. And you shall possess greater nations, mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even on the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. So, I mean, what, what a great promise they received. I mean, you have to remember they're going in, like he said, nations that are mightier and greater in number than themselves. So when they heard these words to them, man, that, that was really something to them. That, that, that hit home. Like, that gave them that confidence that they needed. You know, we're just reading it from a, you know, a, third, from a third party. We're just kind of looking in here. And maybe it doesn't, we don't feel the impact that that promise has, but to them, that meant everything. That no man should be able to stand before you. Whew, what a relief. But again, it all came at a price for them. They, all, they had to do these things. They had to obey God. And he says there in verse 26, he says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. And what is it that he's setting before them? It's the, it's the word of God. It's the commandments. It's the judgments of God. So it's the same thing, but it can be received in one of two ways. The word of God can either be a blessing to you or it can be the curse of you. He's saying, look, you can, either, you can either prosper by keeping my commandments or you can be chastened by disregarding them. That's what he's saying here. It can either be a blessing or a curse to you. Now, <clears throat> notice it's one or the other. And it's not one to the exclusion of the other. He's not, he's not saying like, you know, there's not this middle ground. People get this idea like, well, I just neither then. No, it's going to be one or the other, first of all. And it's, it's going to be one or the other. You know, the, you're going to either obey and be blessed, or you're going to disobey and be cursed. There's no third option. There's no neutral. Right? There's no, well, you know, or you could just, you know, before, behind door three. There's no door three. It doesn't exist. There's no curtain to draw back. It's door one and door two. Blessing, cursing, and it's obedience or disobedience. That's it. Are you still in Romans? You saw something there? <coughs> We're going to look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And what this is showing, because again, he's addressing his people, right? He's addressing, you know, the people that he called out, that have faith in him, that are following him. You know, it's a picture of us today. You know, and it's the same way it does. And what it shows us is that God's people are still subject to God's blessing or cursing. And, and Christians need to learn this today. That just because you're born again, just because you're saved, doesn't, doesn't mean you're immune to God's wrath. Yep. I mean, we know that we're not going to go to hell. We know that because we're saved, that we, can't, we couldn't go there, even if we wanted to, right? That we are, but we are still subject to the chastening hand of God on this earth. While you still have breath as God's child, God can still curse you on this earth the bible says in romans 8 look at verse 1 it says there is therefore now no condemnation with them or in which are in christ jesus and so many churches today they want to put a period right there and i've talked to people christians who are you know they're just living wicked life they're backslidden you know they're living in sin and i said god's gonna judge you oh no no i talked to my my pastor at my church and he said there is no condemnation them which are in christ jesus What's condemnation? Judgment. You know, being found guilty. Yep. Being condemned, right? And they'll say, well, you know, I'm in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. It goes on, though. That verse does, that's not where that verse ends. Your pastor forgot to keep reading. Mm -hmm. Can you see why maybe you might want to get the book open for yourself? And actually get in what it says? And he says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So there's the caveat. Yeah, there's no condemnation. And we understand there's no condemnation in Christ in the sense that we're saved, we're not going to go to hell. And it's really the primary application of the scripture. But the same way, they like to interpret it and say, oh, well, you know, we, God's not going to, all we're under grace. They're, you know, that's all Old Testament stuff that you're talking about. God's not going to judge me. Well, if you don't walk after the flesh and after the spirit, yeah, I agree. You know, if you keep his commandments, if you obey him, if you seek him with all your heart, soul, and strength, if you love him and you're, and you're endeavoring to serve him and obey him, yeah, you're right. If you're walking in the Spirit. But he says right there, it's who walk not after the flesh. So when you're living in sin, when you're disobeying God's commandments, 
when you're when you're you know uh, you're getting into doing the things that God said don't do that you know what you you are subject to condemnation you are subject to God cursing you how else is it a curse then how how else could God say hey I set before you a blessing and a curse if the curse just doesn't apply to you that doesn't make any sense then it would be I just set before you a blessing and that's it no he said it's a blessing and a curse it can go either way and it's all hinges on your obedience that's why he says in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. You know, you're going to suffer the wrath of God. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Look, if there's no condemnation, what need is there to mortify the flesh? Why did Paul have to tell us in Colossians 3, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. So why did he have to say that? Why did he have to say, hey, mortify your members, otherwise you're going to suffer the same consequences as the children of disobedience. If, if we're not, if, hey, if, if there is no condemnation. It's because there is condemnation, even if we are in Christ, that we can still suffer for our sins, that we can still be cursed if we don't obey God and keep his commandments. Now, can you disobey God's commandments your whole life and, and be, be wicked and, and be saved and still go to heaven? Yes. But is that really the, the, the life you want to live? Get to heaven and say, man, that took forever. That was miserable, Lord. Boy, he oh, heaven will be so much sweeter. No, it won't. All you'll get there is you'll, you'll get there and you'll realize how much you missed out on. And you'll see all those people that you thought were just a bunch of old fuddy-duddies bunch of goody two-shoes going to church and, and do, believe in the Bible and obeying the Bible. And they'll be up there rejoicing. They'll be glorified. They'll be given ten cities and so on and so forth. They'll have great rewards. Yeah. And all you'll have is nothing. You'll be saved so as by fire. Yeah. You'll get in by the skin of your teeth. And, and, but you'll have no reward. Is that really what you want for your life? Is that really what you want as Christians? No, of course. I hope not. You know, and that's why we have to take this to heart and say, look, let's mortify the members of our, of our flesh. Realize that we're walking around in a corpse that still has a pulse. We're dead men walking. That, this, that we're just waiting for our bodies to be, to be done away. That the old man is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But, and yet, the, the life that I would now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's the life we're going to live. The life in the new man. And we're going to wait for this body to pass away. So we see here that, you know, God, he's laying before them, his own people. He's saying, look, this is a blessing or a curse, a blessing if you obey and a curse if you disobey. That's what God is laying out when he gives us his statutes and his judgments. When God hands us, this, when we, <laughs> God shows us the scripture and gives us the Bible, it can go either way. And what we see is that you aren't blessed as a Christian just because, you know, you know not, God isn't just going to bless you just because you're a Christian, yep. just because you're saved. Now, being saved is a blessing in and of itself, the greatest blessing of all. But that's not, you know, oh, you're saved, now let me just bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. No, you gotta be you gotta obey. You're not you're not just gonna be blessed because you grew up in church. Well, I grew up in church. Well, did you learn anything? <laughs> did you apply it to your life? Did you actually use that to, to please God with your life? You know, you're not gonna, you know, the, those of us, the, the the children that are growing up with godly parents. You're not going to be blessed by God just because your parents were godly, good parents. You're going to be blessed by God when you actually do the things that your godly parents told you. When you actually would apply the things you were instructed in your life to do. You're not going to just be blessed just because. You actually have to put in your own. And I could, I could tell you stories. I could get up here and we could talk about people that I knew that grew up in great Christian homes that are full bone reprobates today. That they quit on God, and it happened quick. It was overnight. They turned 18, they're out the door within a couple years, just full blown fags. It happens. Why? Because it's not, it's, it's, you're not blessed just because. Right. It's got to be personal to you. It has to mean something to you personally. You have to make it your own at some point. And, and if you don't, well, it might not be the blessing. And I'm not going to say if you don't, you're going to turn into a reprobate. I'm just saying, don't be, you know, that kind of thing happens. You know, people get out of sorts with God and they, and, they, and they think, well, you know, I grew up in a church, I grew up with parents, and, and so God's just going to bless me just because. No. Yep. 
You, you still have to make it your own. There comes a point where we have to own these things for ourselves. <coughs> he says there in verse, uh, we're back in Deuteronomy, he says, Behold, verse 26, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. And he says in verse 20 says, 27, A blessing if you obey, right? The commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. A blessing if you obey. And he says in verse 28, And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. So it, it's, all, it's, all the, it's all the word of God. It's how, how we're going to apply it to our lives. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with what you've learned at church? What are you going to do with what you've read in your Bible? What are you going to do with what your parents have taught you? You know, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to turn into a blessing or are you going to turn into a curse? Because those, those are the two options. That's what's on the table. And it shall come to pass, verse 29, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee land whither thou goest, that thou shalt put these blessings upon Mount uh, Gerizim, Gerizim, Gerizim and then the curse upon Mount Ebal. Now, I think this is interesting, and I think God's trying to show us something here. So he's saying, look, when you go into this land, there's going to be these two mountains. And you're going to put the blessing on one and the curse upon the other. You're going to put the blessing upon uh, you know, Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. And I think there's significance here. You know, God could have just said, put them next to each other where it's real easy to get to. You're going to find a flat plain and you're just going to set them there, right? Why does he say a mount? You know, well, one, one thing could be because he wants us to be able to see it. You know, he wants everyone, you know, when things are elevated, everybody can see it. He wants to get the message across to everybody. But I think really what he's trying to show us here is that, you know, them being placed upon mountains, what it shows us is that both take effort to attain. You know, that there's, there's effort that goes into either life. There's effort that goes into a life that's blessed. There's effort that goes into a life that's cursed. It takes effort to, to reach either one. If you want to climb up Mount, Mount Ebal in your life, you know, that's going to take effort. If you want to climb up Mount Gerizim, that's going to take effort as well. Each one is going to take effort. You know, disobedience, it comes more naturally to us, doesn't it? Is it? That is our nature. And we're born in sin. But think about it. It still takes purpose to live a disobedient life. You know, you still have to put effort into that. Like, I, it made me think of this verse in Proverbs 26. It says, Whosoever diggeth a pit shall fall therein. Right? It's a guy who's being cursed because of his wickedness. He's, he's laying a trap. He's a wicked man. He's, doing, he's not obeying, right? He's not loving his neighbor as himself. He's digging a pit so that somebody can fall therein. He says, uh, and, and who, I mean, digging a pit's hard, right? There's effort that goes into that, especially here in Arizona. Good night. Man, I moved out here from Michigan. And I remember a guy in, in Michigan, I had a, a job at an excavating firm. I remember sitting in the truck with him on, a, on lunch break and him saying, he was from Arizona, he said, if you ever move to Phoenix, don't ever get a job doing this. Don't ever get a job digging anything whatsoever. Because he, he was telling me about the ground here. And I remembered that after I got a job digging here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My first week or two here, I got some cash job digging footers. I'm just going off on a story right now. But I mean, the first week I ended up with heat stroke. I mean, my arm seized up. I, had, I laid in bed with a fever for like two days. I show up in the job and we're, we're digging footers for a house, you know, and, and the guy hands me a pickaxe. I'm like, we're not mining for gold. What, what's this about? He's like, well, we got to dig. And because I'm from Michigan where it's just one giant sand dune where you could just dig with one hand. You're like, oh, it's sand the whole way. It's just like 10 feet of sand. I mean, I've dug down to my mom's. I mean, she got a crack in her wall. It was like a 10 foot basement on, on two different occasions. We dug all the way by hand to the bottom of it in like an hour. I mean, it didn't take long at all. You just dig a big hole. You know, it was work, but it was easy. Good luck doing that here. Man, you got to get these pneumatic jackhammers out and everything like that. The point I'm trying to make is it takes effort to dig a hole, <laughs> right? If you don't get anything else tonight, you got that. <laughs> and if you're going to dig a hole, prepared, be prepared to sweat, stay hydrated, and don't do it here. But <laughs> what he's saying, look, it takes effort to do wickedness, doesn't it? It takes effort to dig a pit. And guess what? You're the one that's going to fall therein. You're still going to be cursed. He that rolleth a stone. Right? There's effort being put into being a wicked person. I'm going to get this guy and you roll up a stone, right? That's hard work. It will return upon him. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. It's not like you get to just be God's child and put the word on the shelf and say, that, and, uh, I, I don't want the blessing. 
look, it, then you're going to live a cursed life. There's not this middle ground. You don't get to walk up to Mount Gerizim and Mount, uh, what's the other, Mount Ebal and just walk down the middle. Well, I'm just going to stay in the valley. No, you've got to pick one. Which, which, which mount are you going to ascend in your life? The one that leads to a curse or the one that leads to a blessing? They both take effort. You can't stay in the valley. He that despises the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. You see that again? There's one that's despising it and there's one that's fearing it. One's being uh, destroyed and one's being rewarded. <coughs> it's black and white in the scripture. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. People think like, oh, if I just, oh, the, you know, living the godly Christian life is so difficult. Go live an ungodly one and see how hard that is. Yeah, right. You think keeping God's commandments and doing the things that God commands of you and demands of us is difficult? And then and, and, and you forget about the blessings that are, that are come on the other side. Right. You know, and, there, and, and we, could, we could talk about them here. I mean, the blessings, you know, of, of, you know, being married. One man, one woman for life. That's a blessing. There's a lot of, you know, is that always the easiest thing to do? No. It takes work. It takes effort. But there's blessing in it. You know, blessing and raising godly children. That's hard work. There's a lot of effort that goes into disciplining and teaching and instructing and, and loving and being patient with children. But you know what? There's a great reward at the other side. Is it difficult? Yes. But there's a reward. And you think that's hard? Then, then, then don't discipline. Then don't raise godly children and watch how much harder it turns out to be in the end. When the curse comes, the way of the transgressor is hard. I mean, if you've been out doing any, any soul winning, any door knocking, you go into some of these neighborhoods where there's a lot of transgressors and you, you don't have to look very far, folks, and you, you start to see people that have been living a hard life without God. And we say, whoa, I don't want that. No, well, you're right, you don't. You know, but hey, it takes effort either way. They didn't end up that way in accident. They made decisions that led them to where they are. Every, every transgressor that's had a ha hard life has had a life full of decisions that he made. And who knows, he might even been, you know, he, he might even be saved. He might even be, he have grown up in a good godly home and been a part of a good godly church at one point. But one day he made a decision to ignore the word and to start going up this other mount. Mm -hmm. and, that, and didn't know, he thought, well, maybe it'll lead somewhere else. It's not going to lead anywhere else except to the curse. <coughs> so you can't stay in the valley in life. You've got to choose one or the other. You know, which, which, which one are we going to go up? We're going to go up. The, 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 the one that's going to we're going to go up Gerizim to the blessing or are we going to go up to Ebal to the curse <coughs> you can't stay in the valley the Bible says and that's why the psalmist prayed you know incline mine ear uh, incline not my heart to any evil thing to practice wicked works with men that work iniquity and let me not eat of their dainties so we say hey you know the mount of the blessing it might be hard to climb up right that mount up to uh, Mount Gerizim it looks rocky. It looks rough. It's a hard climb to keep all these commandments. It takes effort. And there might not be as many people on that mountain. <laughs> There's a lot of people over here, you know, on Mount Ebal. And they're like, hey, let's go up this mountain. You know, there might be more company. But here's the thing. The company over on Mount uh, Ebal, in my opinion, is better. Or uh, Gerizim, excuse me. It's better company. You know, there might not be as many people here tonight as there are in the bar you know, over near some university right now. Right now, there's some bar somewhere that's just packed out with people. They're all laughing and smiling and carrying on and having a good time. But you know what? The company over here is better, in my opinion, Amen. because of everything that goes along with that scene. Right. And it's fake. <coughs> so maybe we need to pray that prayer tonight. You know, if we're feeling like e-ball is kind of calling to us, we think, well, maybe e-ball is the way to go. Maybe it's not so bad at the top, you know. Maybe you need to pray, incline not my heart to do to, uh, to uh, any evil thing. You know, maybe that sometimes that's where we just have to start. Like, look, it's not even, Lord, it's not even, Lord, help me to do the right thing. It's just like, help me to not do the wrong thing. Maybe we just need to start there. Lord, just help me to not do anything evil. That's why I said at the beginning of the sermon. Maybe we just need to focus on not doing the wrong thing. That's a good place to start. And sometimes that's just where we need to be. And again, you know, it's another sermon about obedience and the consequences of disobedience. It's another one out of the book of Deuteronomy. And you know what? There's going to be more. 
because this keeps coming up over and over and over. But you got to remember, it's, it's a pinnacle point for Israel. You know, they're, they're crossing over the promised land. Moses, their leader, is passing off the scene. He's not going to be there to keep them in check. It's up to them now. And it's the same way with us. You know, at some point, you have to take ownership for your own Christian life and live it. And you have to, that's why obedience is just being emphasized over and over. And, and you know, it, it sounds redundant, but, you know, the more I read the Bible, the more I listen to preaching, the more preaching I do myself, the more I just continue to live the Christian life, the more I understand the need to emphasize obedience. Just because that's the thing we all struggle with. I mean, that is the Christian life in, in, in a nutshell, is the spirit versus the flesh. Amen. And it just comes down to obedience versus disobedience. And that's why it's just being emphasized over and over and over again. And that's why this chapter, like so many others, is just summed up by that old saying. You know, the path of God's blessing is through the door of obedience. Let's go ahead and pray.